Man. 
and you will. Amen. Good evening. It's good to be in the back of the Lord's house this evening. This 13th day of December. 12 days to Christmas. Figure that. Uh, let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. We are still studying over Elijah. And uh, do want to say that we had a, a outstanding time this past Sunday yeah. as we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the church awesome. and uh, if I know those that, that were here can testify to that and if you weren't here well you missed a blessing for sure Good. and then we had a potluck after that just to top it all off and the food was good and we had plenty of it and uh you know, the Lord just truly blessed the day. Amen. We've been looking and we have seen in our studies that uh, as Elijah had uh, had ran away, basically, because he was scared of what Jezebel, the threat that she had made upon him. And he figured out, or he figured amongst himself, that he wasn't any better than his father's. And since he wasn't any better than his father's, the Lord might as well just go ahead and, and, and kill him right there under that uh, juniper tree that he found. And, uh, you know, we look at this and we've seen the, uh, the ministry of the prophet which is you know the, uh, the a ministry of consideration and then we saw it was a, uh, a ministry of compassion there in verses 5 through 8 and we looked and uh, we saw it involved uh the involved grace that was in it in verses 7 and 8. And here in verses 9 through 14, we see that it is a ministry of confrontation. In verse 9 it says, And he came uh, thither unto a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And before the Lord passed by, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle. And he went out and stood in the entering end of the cave. And behold, there came a voice upon him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord of hosts, 
because the children of Israel had forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So we find this ministry of confrontation that the Lord uses. While the Lord was very considerate of the prophet's needs and compassionate with him while he worked through his problems, God knew that the root of his problem had to be dealt with. Elijah had sin and pride in his heart. And they had to be rooted out before the Lord could use him again. And these verses tell us how the Lord went about getting the prophet's attention. There in verse 9 and 10, we find a challenge. Elijah, he arrives at Mount Horeb. And this mountain was a place of great significance for the children of Israel. Here, it was that Moses had met God by a burning bush. Here, God had handed down His law to the people of Israel. And perhaps Elijah went here so that he too might hear the voice of God. And when he arrives, he, he goes into a cave and he sits down to wait for the Lord to speak and he's not disappointed. We find that the Lord's voice does come to the prophet in that dismal cave. And when the Lord speaks, it is to issue a challenge for the Lord asks Elijah a question. And he says, What doest thou here, Elijah? What are you doing here? And this question is a rebuke of the prophet. What God is asking Elijah is this. Elijah, what are you doing in a cave on Mount Horeb? Did I not send you to preach to my people Israel? Shouldn't you be in Israel leading my people in a great revival? I didn't call you to run to this cave and to hide yourself away. I called you to stand before kings, to defy false gods and prophets, and to be an example of righteousness for the people of Israel. So Elijah, again, what are you doing here? And I, and I, I you know, nowhere in Scripture does it put it that way. But we can imagine that's what the Lord is saying unto Elijah. And it was called for Elijah to examine his life and to examine his priorities. It was a call for Elijah to come face to face with the fact that he had sinned against the Lord. And of course, Elijah replies by reminding the Lord of all that he has done and how alone he is. Basically, what we find here is Elijah is whining about what he thinks the problem is. By the way, if, if we must whine, we must resolve to do it only to the Lord because He can take it. It just drives other people crazy. So we came here and, and, and we know that His response, uh, you know, he, uh, the, the Lord asked Him in verse 9, What doest thou here, Elijah? And then Elijah responded, Well, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel. They forsake, they forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altar, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And, you know, 
The only one that's seeking to take his life away is Jezebel. But he's trying to justify his sin. Why he ran away. Why he went against what God wanted him to do. And so he's justifying it by trying to remind the one that knows everything what he has done. God knows what he's done because God was there with him when he did it. It was God that gave him the strength to do it with. So God's not ignorant of the fact of what Elijah had done. Only thing God wants to know, and God knows it anyway, because He knows that He's got sin in His heart. But what God wants to know is, Elijah, what are you doing here? Think about it, Elijah. What are you doing here? You know, we look at this. And if I wonder, I wonder if God is asking anyone, you know, at times, whether He's asking anybody the same question. You know, what are you doing here? I didn't save you to be in this condition. I didn't call you to do, uh, to be doing things like that. I think that you know at times when he when he does do those things because we deserve it that it is it's us that is just sitting here and we just you know we don't have a good reason why we're doing what we're doing or anything else. Elijah didn't have a good reason for being where he was. Why'd you run away, Elijah? Just because Jezebel threatened you? Man, the, the, the priests and the 450 prophets of Baal threatened you, but you're still here. You know, there have been a number, number of times when God, with God that we may have heard that gentle rebuke from the Holy Spirit. We allow ourselves to wander from the path of fidelity to the Lord and we go our own way. Or we develop a bad attitude. Or we get slack in our service to God. Or we walk into open sin. And when we do, the Lord says, What are you doing here? What are you doing here? This is God's way of getting our attention. If he were to speak to us today, would he have to ask anyone here the same question? It's tough to think about, but I thank God for the challenges from the Word of God and from the Spirit of God. And we need to remember, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Revelation 3 and verse 19. If the Lord challenges your life, it's only because He loves you. Not only do we find a challenge, but we find it's a command there in verse 11. He tells it. God tells him. He says, And God said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, break into pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind in the earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. So we find that it's a command. The Lord has, He's got Elijah's attention. And he commands the prophet to stand before God. And by the way, this is where Elijah should have been all along. And it will be where every born again Christian will be one day. will be standing before the Lord. God is calling Elijah back 
to the place of total surrender, to the place where nothing was greater in his sight than the Lord God. You see, Elijah had let Ahab and Jezebel and the sins of the people get higher than God. God calls him back to the place where nothing but God matters. And for us today, in the world today, that is the place where we all need to be. You know, our problems aren't our problems. Our trials aren't our problem either. Did you know that uh, uh, your depression, your discouragement, your defeat, they aren't your problem. Did you know that even your sins aren't your real problem? When we have problems in life, whether they're spiritual, material, emotional, the real root of the problem is that something has gotten larger than God in our eyes. And if He is all that He claims to be, then what problems are there? If he, is, if he is really God and He is really in control, then He can take care of any situation. Just like Elijah, we must learn to take our hands off the wheel and relinquish all control to the Lord. You know, we need to, to take the admonition from the book of Hebrews and fill our vision with Jesus and Jesus alone. You know, when, when we come around to it, the point is, is that if we would look back, all the problems that Elijah had, God took care of him. He took care of him when Ahab was looking for him. He hid him out at the brook Cherith and he fed him, provided him with water. Then when the water ran out, what did he do? He took care of him again in Zarephath with the widow woman. And then he turned around and, and God took care of him when he challenged the Baal prophets and the king about which God is what or what God is what. And God took care of him there. All through this journey from, from chapters uh, 16 to where we are, God has taken care of him. I don't understand why one little old woman has got him in such a stir, but she does. And Elijah, he had lost count. Oh, he, re, he was quick to remind the Lord about all the things that he had done, but he was very short at remembering what the Lord had done for him. For it was the Lord who had enabled him to do these things that he proclaims that he did. So we've seen uh, the challenge. We've seen a command what a, about the confrontation again here. And Verse the, the last half of verse 11 down in through verse 14. While Elijah stood in that cave on Mount Horeb, we find that the Lord passed by. And first there was a great strong wind that rent the mountains. Then an earthquake that shook the mountain to its foundation. And then after that, there was a great fire. However, we are told that the Lord was in neither of any of these. And after that, there was a still, small 
voice. What the earthquake and the fire and the wind could not do. The small, still voice did. It touched Elijah's heart. This is what Elijah needed. He needed to know that God isn't interested in the great striking things that impress men. He is interested in working in men's hearts. Elijah was used to the remarkable. He was used to the astounding. After all, who else was fed by ravens? Who else saw God feed three people with a barrel and a jug of oil that never ran out? Who else had seen God raise someone from the dead? Who else had rebuked a king and lived? Who else had defiled or defied 450 Baal prophets, prayed fire down from heaven, and then killed the prophets? Elijah is used to the very spectacular. And God wants to teach him that it is God's work in the heart of the individual that is vitally important. All those things, sure. God had intended to do all those things and He did them through Elijah. But most of all, God wants to work in our hearts. God wants to teach him that it is God's work in the heart of the individual that is important. The very power of God is in the Word of God and in the work of His Spirit in the hearts of men. You know, at times we're guilty of the very same things, aren't we? When we, see, when we see great things happening, we get excited. When we see the church growing, people getting saved, shouting, and all the wonderful things we all like to see, we get fired up and we talk about how the Lord is moving. However, we forget that God doesn't always move in big, visible, outward manifestations. Often the greatest works of God are still done in the secret places of man's heart. And as God speaks to and grows the individual, His glory is revealed in ways that it cannot be otherwise. God is in the business of growing men into the image of His Son, not working miracles. However, taking a sinner saving Him by grace, reproducing Jesus in Him is the greatest miracle of all. We've seen the misery of the prophet, the ministry of the prophet. What about the mending of the prophet? Look at verse 15 through verse number 21. It says, And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Saphat of Abel-Mehola shalt then anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of, of Hazael shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elijah slay. And yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, 
and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So he departed thence and found Elijah, the son of Shapha, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelve. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people and they did eat then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him we find in this we find the mending of the prophet there in verses 13 and 14 they tell us that Elijah is again asked a question what doest thou here Elijah and his response is still the same old whiny answer. We have to note that God's question is in present tense. And Elijah's answer is past tense. It doesn't matter what you've done for the Lord in the past. The questions, what are you doing today? This time God sets the prophet straight and tells him how things really are. God has a threefold plan for getting Elijah back on track. So let's uh, see what this plan is there in verse 15 through 17. We find that it involved a new commission. Elijah is giving marching orders again. Now, we, we've sat here and he's done run from God he's run from Jezebel he's run from the people of Israel and he's found his place wished he was dead God found him God called him asked him what are you doing here and he tried to remember you know he tried to remind God oh God you know all the things I did blah 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 but God wasn't impressed upon all that because God enabled him to do those things. And then we find that even in, down in and through uh, verse 14, that God had got his attention. God has searched out his heart. And now we find that Elijah is involved in a new commission. God has a new job for him. Elijah is told to return to Israel through Syria. And there he is to anoint two kings and a prophet. He is given an important assignment from the Lord. He is given evidence that the Lord is not finished in his life. And surely this was an encouragement to the man of God. It would do those who have wandered off from the Lord's path good if they were to come before Him confess that they've sinned and ask Him for a new assignment. The Lord is faithful. He forgives and He will use us again. Like Elijah, you might not ever be what you were before, but you can still be a blessing to the kingdom of God. If you are wallowing in the pit of depression, why not bring that to the Lord and ask Him to use you again for His glory? He still has plans for your life. Or else, you'd already be in heaven. Because as long as we are still here, God's got a plan for us. We will never leave this place until God is finished with us. In 
verse 18. We find that it involved a new comfort. Twice Elijah had complained that he was all alone in his devotion to the Lord. He did it in verse 10, he did it in verse 14, and however God tells him that there are 7,000 others who have not worshipped Baal. Elijah, you're not alone, is what God was telling him. There are others who will stand with you. And Elijah, Elijah's given hope in his heart again. He's, he's given encouragement that there are others out there that still love the Lord. You know, we aren't alone either. And whether it's discouragement, depression, sin, or anything else you wish to name, others have been through it and are going through it as well. Even if no human comfort can be found, the Lord knows what you are going through and is ever present to help you through any crisis that we may face. Let us not forget to turn to Him for the help that we need. We're going to stop. Right there. We just have to remember that not only is the Lord with us, but there are other brothers and sisters in Christ that are with us. That have been through the exact same things that we've been through. Or perhaps that you're going through. So remember that we just need to trust the Lord. So until next time, remember we have church Christmas party is Saturday night at 5 p.m. Okay, Saturday at 5. So we'll see you there, hopefully. God bless you all.